live. Okay. So uh, welcome everybody to MadeAcon 2020 once again. Uh, this is our fourth panel of seven today. So uh, yeah, halfway, not quite halfway through. Um, but I'm your moderator again, David Walters. And just a quick thank you for tuning in. Uh, and again, as always, since it's live, feel free to submit any questions or comments. Uh, we'll try to pick out some questions if we have time. Uh, but let's begin with some introductions from our panel and we can kind of get down to it. So if we want to go, we'll start with Brian, go that way and then go down and then across. Okay, sure. Um, I'm Brian Maslin. I'm a fantasy author with Tor. Uh, my debut, Blood of Nightsile, came out in 2019 and the sequel, Sorcery of a Queen, is coming out August of this year. Um, I'm Mike Shackle. I'm author of We Are the Dead, published by Glance last year, um, out in the States just recently. And the sequel of Fool's Hope is coming out at uh, Christmas time. Uh, I'm Justin Call. Uh, my debut, Master of Sorrows, came out in 2019 in the UK and this February in the US. And the sequel, Master Artificer, is coming out uh, 2021 in February. But there may be an ebook novella in between sometime this fall. We'll see. Hi, uh, I'm Luke Arnold. My uh, First de yeah, debut novel, The Last Smile in Sunder City, came out uh, with Orbit Books earlier this year. A, a long year it's been, though. And uh, the sequel comes out, a uh, sequel, Dead Man in the Ditch, comes out in September. Uh, I'm Andrea Stewart, uh, and my epic fantasy debut, The Bone Shard Daughter, is coming out with Orbit uh, in September of this year. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you, everybody, for popping in and uh, taking the time out of today to come chat about world building. Uh, so yeah, so, you know, world building, what is up with that? Uh, but we'll start out with an easy question. Does anybody know where the term world building was first seen and or used? Obviously. Can't say I do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was gonna be a hard one to start with. It's <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have no idea. <laughs> That's okay. That's fine because I have the answer. Um, so it was first used in the Edinburgh Review in December of 1820. Ooh. And it first appeared in A.S. Eddington's Space, Time, and Gravitation, an outline of the general relativity theory in 1920 to I'm describe okay. the thinking out of hypothetical <laughs> worlds with different physical laws. I didn't think you guys would know. I just, you know. <laughs> Why not have a history lesson? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so easier question. Um, so you all, I've read everybody's work so far, except for Andrew's, obviously, because her, her debut comes out in a few months. But everybody has written a very descriptive world, all vastly different. Um, but do you find it easier to write in a fictional world rather than an urban setting? Does anybody else write? Question in stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, when when you first think about a, a, a novel, I guess, or when you imagine a book in your you know in your mind, do you think it would be easier to write in a fictional world because you can make things up as you go, or do you have to have uh, you know real world uh, boundaries uh, in order to write in? Look, for me, like, it's definitely a huge safety net. I get. Uh, Whenever I do have to deal with things in the real life, like as much as, especially if you come to political, cultural things where you, well, could go wrong or, you know, there's a, especially if you don't do the right research or, you know, it's, I don't know, for me, it's like that ability to launch into big things, explore characters going to some really dark places. For me, beginning, you know, my kind of, yeah, first of all, being in fantasy was very much a way of me being able to run in and tackle big ideas uh, when it felt like there weren't really any boundaries or any rules set up for me that I got to make my own rules and let that take me to certain places. Yeah, so for me, much more comfortable when I had that little bit of a distance of um, make-believe between me and people that I <laughs> yeah, might be dealing with. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I... Mean, I, I um... I take a lot of real world stuff that happened in the past and kind of, kind of twist it slightly. So it feels like I've made it all up. So it, it makes it easier than, you know, wondering whether people had glass in their windows, for example, at a certain time period, you can just look back in history, see what they have change the name slightly, and then take the credit for being incredibly creative and <laughs> coming up with something new. 
So I, I prefer twisting what happened and uh, going from there. Yeah, and I feel like I do a similar thing to Mike, at least in the sense of taking inspiration from real world stuff. I know you did things with like the occupation of France during World War II and that kind of thing. And I did, there's lots of dragons in my book and I did a whole bunch of stuff about apex predators and trophic cascades and stuff like that. But it was fun because it's fantasy and I can make up whatever I want, but there's like a primer of biology and animal stuff that I can just basically steal as much as I want as little, you know, if there's problematic stuff in the real world, you can just wipe it and ignore it for your world. So that, that's like a really fun part of writing fantasy stuff. The stuff I struggled with early on with fantasy though was getting bogged down in like low level world building things. Like should people be shaking hands or doing some other kind of gesture? Like how do you do obscenities and like, you know, how do people reference their gods and that kind well, of thing? Of week, and you're like, should yeah, I, that's like exactly. based on the Norse gods. So should I? <laughs> Rewrite the mythology for my world to this, uh. Yeah, like day, yeah, days and weeks. I spent like way too much time over obsessing what was right and what was wrong there. And I had to learn to just relax a little bit and and just sort of let some things be real world and other things be new and, and let that be kind of a sliding scale. But that took time to figure out. I've I've jokingly told people that I'm glad I'm I don't write historical fiction because I just make things up instead. But at the same time, I think uh, keeping track of what you've made up gets a little difficult. I didn't realize how inconsistent I'd been on some things until I got copy edits back. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I need to start a wiki or something so I can go back and refer to some of the stuff that I'd said earlier. I, I got sent my copy editor's style guide the other day. And I was like, where's this been all my life? I've been getting back <laughs> through documents. And yeah, because you're always like, you're like, you're, they'll change what you wrote and then you're not yeah. sure if you wrote it that way or they wrote it that way. So you're like, if I could have that, it would just save me a lot of time. Seriously ask for it. That's my big tip yeah. of the day. My, for me, I think it's a lot of apples and oranges when it comes to um, modern building, world building versus fantasy world building. Because if you're doing a modern thing, you're supposed to follow the rules of like the world we live in. People don't always do that. And if, and if you're doing your own world, well, you can theoretically do whatever you want, but then as soon as you do whatever you want, you have to follow the rules you created and remember the rules you created. Whereas people that live in the real world, they already know all the rules, so they don't have to keep track of them so much as just the details that they research, and it's easy to double check themselves. So I think they both have crutches and they both have strengths and weaknesses. I just do fantasy because that's what I read and that's what I like. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And they got page one, you can do whatever you want. There are zero rules. But then page two, all the rules from page one you are like you have to deal with. So it's easy to break your world by accident later on in the story or break it on page one and not realize until you get three quarters of the way through that you've made a mistake. So that's oh, I have to retcon that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> For me, there's also a real choice. Like my style, well, my is fantasy. I really tried, I wanted my my books to feel like, you know, like a Raymond Chandler detective story and that the whole thing could be told by this character to someone at a bar after too many drinks. So with my world building, even though there could be certain things that creatively could be really fun, it needed, it, it couldn't get to the point where it becomes so complex that he needs to, suddenly our main character has to describe things to you that it suddenly makes him feel too aware that he's talking to someone from another world who's never experienced this before before so it's always finding that that line to walk down where it does kind of feel new and exciting enough for people who want a fantasy but for those that are really here for the hardball detective story it it needs to make sure he's still bouncing along and things feel natural for him and like he's talking to someone the same way kind of Chandler talks about Los Angeles you know, like you kind of know where Hollywood meets Vine and you know, you know, you have like, you have some idea of what's around there or some idea of the technology. I, yeah, the voice in my books needed to feel that relaxed and that friendly. So that means I kind of keep things somewhere familiar as it goes along. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so I, I think that is actually, Oh, sorry. Yeah, that is a tough thing with like how to communicate parts of the world that everyone in the room should already know because they're living in that world. And that um, I feel like third person is really friendly to that kind of thing because you get more leeway into kind of moving outside the realm. But if um, and my books are all in third person, but I've tried to write things in first person and got tangled up almost right away because I just couldn't communicate the information without it sounding very odd and unnatural. So um, that's tough. 
That's it, because it's almost like trying to keep a secret for everybody. <laughs> when you're writing your first person, like, we're experiencing this. Nobody else is going to understand. <laughs> that, that's a big part of world building, though, because you know all this stuff that is important to what you've created, and you're like, I can't tell you all of it immediately, because if I do, I'm info dumping. And if I don't, you have no idea what's going on. So mm -hmm. where's the balance? And finding that, it makes a good author really good. Yeah. yeah. And, and kind of going off of that, where, where do you find is the balance between info dumping and just letting the reader figure things out for themselves? Well, I think because I know building, a lot of people complain about info dumping all the time, though it yeah. can be helpful. Yeah. I mean, if you're building a really elaborate world, I think you can still have these things come in as it's relevant. Uh, but sometimes you kind of have to um, make sure that it's becoming relevant at an appropriate time <laughs> because you don't want to be, you know, 100 pages into a book and then suddenly you've discovered that there's some animal that everybody uses for transportation, but you just haven't <laughs> said anything about it <laughs> for that long. And everybody's like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> well, I, I think there's the, I, I know when I read books, I skip over those big info dumps that come along. And I, and I really just want to keep the story moving at a fast pace and keeping enthralled in it. And I'll put in enough not to throw you out the story, but I don't want mm -hmm. to put in too much that when you hit it, it just stops all the momentum of the story. Uh, and I, I hate that I know people love books where the world building is so intricate. You know what color stitching has gone into the trousers of the, the, the heroes and, and things like that. But I don't care about it. It's like magic systems, you know. <laughs> I don't care how it works, it's just magic. You, you know, my, my iPhone does stuff, I'm the I don't know the technology that behind it. Well, yeah. I love finding out how the magic works. And when they get when I get to that part where they tell me, I'm like, all right, here we go. Uh, I can figure it out, but I also like when they deny that a little bit. So they make hints so that I get hooked and say, well, how does that work? And if I have enough questions, then by the time they have an opportunity to organically present the information, I'm invested and I want to read the whole section. But if they kind of shoehorn it in, even though I really love learning about magic systems, I do get skeezed out by it because I'm like, this is not the time to be talking about that. We need to keep <laughs> It's actually happening in this story. So it, I think that's like, I'll eat whole sections of info dump and I'll love it if it's given to me in the right way because I really like world building information. But if it's not, I, it sours the whole thing. And I like using dialogue for info dumps because um, it can feel more natural and you can set it up in a way. In like the first couple of pages of my, my first book, I just, I just cheated and there's like, a master sort of alchemist wizard person and then a really young one and the young one screws something up he forgets to make coffee so the master alchemist kind of quizzes him on their way to a dragon slaying and it was like um just the fact and like if you look back at it it's a total crush to like have an info dump and disguise the dialogue but it works pretty well and it can That's move great. like things way faster yeah yeah um and then another nice way if you have people from like different countries or different areas where one really doesn't understand how something works that's like a a nice way to just frame it in a conversation. That oh, it's more transparent when you do that. Yeah. Well, you don't know about this. Let me tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, oh. Let me tell you in this not info dumpy way. <laughs> yeah. I do think if you have an info dump somewhere, and I don't think, I, I know that it's kind of a bad word in, so, in some circles, but I think if you frame it in an interesting way, it's not a bad thing to have a bunch of information there as long as it's interesting to the reader. I, I think, um, and I think one of the things to make it interesting to the reader is for me, it's, it's working out why that information isn't just interesting, but emotionally affecting to one of the characters. And I think that for me, like I, I spend a lot of time just wandering around describing things in my world, but because my, you know, main character has an emotional connection to everything that's happened. The idea, this is a world where the magic has died. He feels partly responsible. So every time he's going to tell you about something that happened or what it, how beautiful it used to be and what it is now, it's, it's, it's painful enough for him that you go, hopefully that makes it feel less, it feels that it actually feels like it's more about character and you're actually getting the, you know, information about the world underneath. Um, but I think that works in any kind of world building stuff that if it, if it means something to someone and, it, and it's affecting them, that seems to rise at the top more than just the descriptions. 
Yeah. There's a cheat in screenwriting that they use that they talk about a lot when they use it. Um, I have I've written some screenplays, none of them got published. But um, one of the cheats is if you're having an info dump, try to have something exciting happening while you're giving the information. The like, pipe in the pool. Yeah. Well, Brian was <laughs> a perfect example that we're going to go slay a dragon while we're walking there. So a time is passing, and b here's some information. But if you can have two things going on at once then it's kind of like slate of hand where you're like, check out this really interesting thing. Also, I'm going to give you some information at the same time. You don't really have to worry about it. It's kind of happening in the background, but you'll kind of absorb it. And it may be important later on, and then you'll feel smart if you happen to remember it. If you don't, no big deal. Uh, and if you can manage that, it's really great. And if you can't, well, there are other ways to do it, I guess. <laughs> well, rewrites. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Catch it. This, this part sucks. You need to take this out. <laughs> yeah, I feel like most info dumps are big things like that. I cut down like 95% of what I actually write because it's not important. Either. Yeah, like, like Luke was saying, the characters wouldn't actually care about it or it doesn't really mean anything to them or it's just uninteresting. And I've had, my editor has given me like a little margin comment of like, how does this thing work exactly? And I give him back like 15 pages. It's like, okay, cool. I know how it works. Now cut everything except these two paragraphs and we're good to go. <laughs> yeah. I gotcha. um, so I kind of want to build off of the writing in a fictional world rather than maybe an urban uh, type setting. Um, I mean, you know, is it better to allow your mind to venture into territories unknown or do you more try to build off things, you know, and then just kind of build extra layers of unknown things to, you know, to the readers. So like, you know, you build off laws that we have, you know, in, in, on the earth, like in, in the States or in the UK or in Canada, certain laws, and then you kind of build on those going, okay, we're going to stretch it just a little bit this way or stretch it that way. And that way people have kind of a small reference of where you're going with it. Is that too much of a question? <laughs> no, no. I, I <laughs> Everybody was giving me I, blank I, I looks. So. Out in advance. <laughs> I, I was trying to think, so I, I aggressively took rules from the real world and then built off of them. In, in The original goal of mine was like, I'm going to make a world that has dragons in it, but everything else is going to be realistic. And that didn't quite, that's not quite true, but that was the original goal. So I would take, you know, if you have massive dragons, so they're an apex predator. So what happens if you remove them from a certain ecosystem? And that's like a trophic cascade thing that there's um, like a cool documentary about the wolves of Yellowstone that I used a lot of inspiration for. And then I would try to just make it cooler. So like when the wolves of Yellowstone all got taken away, like the stream erosion increased and like there was all sorts of like low level plant health problems. And that was interesting to me, but I wanted to make it more exciting. So in in my world when you take away dragons from some places like groups of psychotic monkeys go insane and sort of take full control over towns and like that just becomes the monkey's territory and no one can go in there anymore so you can take like you know stream erosion and do something a little bit more interesting with it when you're making your world but yeah i was very very tied to like um real world principles with with the world building that i made cool i, I think it's fun to throw in stuff that is very weird into your world, but I also think that you can't do that too much, otherwise you're gonna kind of alienate your reader. And I think there's a balance there too. If you're a better writer, you can maybe get away with that a little bit more. Um, but if you're <laughs> if you're struggling a little bit, then maybe don't throw in stuff that's very, very strange. Um, and I think having some kind of real world inspiration is often very helpful. Um, I know in my book, magic system, um, I took some inspiration from software programming, which, um, so there is like a logic to it, so it makes sense to people still. So oh, basically, cool. if you're not a well-known author, don't do a whole lot of weird things. If you are well-known, <laughs> just, just try it. Well, uh, I think, uh, I think it's like it. less like well-known, but I think like it's when no, you get um, too many things that are very, very weird. You have to keep track of those and make sure that you're being consistent in the world and that they are affecting the other things in the world, that they're affecting the characters, that they're affecting the economy. So if you put too many weird things in there, I think it becomes a lot more difficult to keep track of and to make that world still se seem uh, realistic. Unless you're Jeff Vandermeer. <laughs> yeah, some authors get away with it. They just, they're just like, I just admire them so much, but right. yeah. The worst thing is when you write a line in book one, which you just think sounds cool, and then in book two, you get to that point, and you're like, why did I write that? I now need to work out how this actually exists. You know, that name I gave someone, 
you know, what's that mean for everyone else in their country and how are they how are they going to be named? And and just throw away things that you can get away with in book one, just become this rolling ball of weirdness that goes on and on as, as you go through the series. By the time you get to book three, you just hate the person that wrote book one. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can remember arbitrarily making the decision for no reason, and now you have to live with it with all these guys. <laughs> Completely. And you're just like, why did I do that? Like, <laughs> because it was cool, probably. Exactly. Yeah, it sounded cool at the time. And now here I am, like, having to figure out a way to make it work. <laughs> um. So I'm going to uh, take a question just from the comments that I've seen. I just saw one come across from uh, Gabriella. So it says, what would you say that is the main connection between you and the world you last created? <laughs> Don't know. I'll answer it once. <laughs> well, no, no, my world was pretty grim. And uh, when I started writing my book, I started writing it in November 2016. And stuff had happened in the UK. And stuff had happened in the US and I I remember just sitting there thinking the bad guys had won and, and that kind of got me thinking like who are the heroes are going to come and save us and I couldn't see anyone and then I just thought about fancy books that I'd read where there was always that knight in shining armor Aragon coming in or Logan nine fingers and I just thought in the real world that just doesn't happen and it's ordinary people that have to rise up and save the day. So that that really was the impetus from what I was seeing around me, you know, whether it's, you know, Greta Thunberg and climate change and, you know, these are ordinary people that didn't ask for any of this responsibility but are reacting to stuff that's thrown on them. Um, and, and that really was the connection between now and the book I wrote, but it propelled me into a very dark world that I'd never want to go to myself. I think for me, my most personal connection for why the world came out this way, I, I was writing it, I'd started when I was living in New York, um, and I only lived in New York for about a year and, and didn't didn't enjoy it all that much, um, mostly just because it was very difficult to have access to like true wilderness and nature and that kind of thing. Um, and then I moved uh, to Colorado, and as I was really starting to write the book like with a purpose was when I was, you know, for the first time in like a year, year and a half, able to just hike out into the true like kind of wilds of Colorado and feel surrounded by like animals and nature and that kind of thing. So I wanted to write a book that had a lot of that feeling in it and did feel very full of um, full of animals and not just dragons, but the whole thing was just kind of overwhelming and like man has not conquered like the, the, the nature yet. You know, it's still a very wild place that's untamed. So I think my world building skewed a lot in that direction just because I'd like come out of like never leaving, you know, New York City. And then all of a sudden I had this whole wild state that I could, I could, you know, be around in. So. Yeah, mine's similar to Mike a little bit where I think uh, I, and it's kind of changed as it's gone on, but especially recently, I'm very much about how you try and do good in a world that feels broken. And, and I have a real cynicism of easy heroism that I think, yeah, that it, it does feel at this time that uh, those kind of characters, yeah, and that's kind of a little bit what I think mine's, what I want to explore with mine as well, is that it's it's kind of actually using some different books to go down different ways you might try and solve, and whether that's with violence or different ways you try and attack a world where things are falling apart and, uh, and where, not many actual problems can be solved in our world by picking up a weapon and going out and, and cutting off heads till the world is right at itself. And so it's kind of fun taking, you know, a kind of traditional fantasy world and having almost someone who's a bit more got the sensibilities of someone in our day and age who's in that world struggling with, yeah, how to fix the problems that I think a lot that keep a lot of us up at night. Um, but in a world where the audience would probably expect because there are, you know, we, we've got we've got dragons and uh, monsters and things here. We'd expect like, oh, we'll just you know, there's a bit of that feeling like we'll just go pick up a flaming sword and go kill someone and things will be better. And actually, like digging into why that actually doesn't fix things, even though it's a tempting idea sometimes. Um, for me, I I wanted to write something that was um, in an Asian inspired setting. Um, I'm half Chinese, so that was kind of a personal thing for me. There's a lot of 
We lost your audio a little bit. Oh. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back now. Yeah. I <laughs> Um, oh, I was just saying that I wanted to write something in an Asian inspired setting um, since I'm half Chinese. And to me, it was nice to kind of add in some of the things that I'm familiar with. Um, there's a lot of like food. It's very important in their culture. So that's kind of the personal connection for me. I think for my own book, it's kind of two sides because one is less personal even though it kind of drives a lot of the themes of my book and one is more personal but it takes a big back seat to everything else that's going on um one being like the question of one man's hero is another man's villain and i like that concept because in the world that we live in now everything is so divisive and people are constantly seeing it it is me versus you and i've always seen it as we should all be on the same side it's just we have a different way of talking about things that places certain values above others. But the reality is we all care about people being happy and, and all these other things. And how we go about achieving those things can become so divisive and can lead us to be so um, cruel to people. So I wanted to represent that in my story. But for me personally, I think that the deepest personal connection, the main character has a, a steward that takes care of him, a priest. And uh, a lot of people have told me that they, they really liked that character relationship more than anything else in the book. They thought that was the best part done in the book, which I always thought was interesting because it was one of the easiest parts for me to write because I just based it on my relationship with my father and my relationship with my son. So I just characterized all the weird things that my dad had done with me when I was a kid and all the things that I continue to do with my son as a result of my dad. And so that relationship played out very thickly into the novel, I think, in a good way. Um, that was personal. I gotcha. Um, new question. Does world building require rich history be presented in massive info dumps? We'll go back to info dumps. <laughs> uh, or do you think sprinkling in tidbits here and there works just as well? Because I know we talked about, you know, kind of bringing magic in in a way or bringing in uh, cultural things. Uh, but, like, do you feel like fantasy has or world building has to have a rich history in order to be good? And if so, how do you how do you introduce it? I don't think it, it it's hard to ever say there's a requirement for anything to be good. So I, I I'm sure that there's fantasy out there that has like almost non-existent like history. It sort of just lives in the moment. It's wonderful. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I'm sure one will come to me. But I feel like in terms of books that do have rich histories and do a good job of avoiding info dumps with sort of these little moments, the one that I think of is is a Song of Ice and Fire and in a Game of Thrones. And I remember, I mean there. That, that is not a book without info dumps, but one of my favorite moments when I first started reading it was, it's like early on, but they're they're heading south towards um, um, King's Landing and they meet a group of the King's Guard kind of on the road. And there's just this moment between, you don't really know who these characters are, but you can tell they know each other and they've fought on different sides of a war and some of them are old and, you know, kind of well-respected and others are not. And I remember that moment being really striking because I was reading it without a lot of context. So I was like, oh, there's like generations and generations of history and custom surrounded in this one moment. You don't have all the information. I didn't really know what the King's Guard were, but it was just super compelling. And and I was okay not understanding everything because the moment was so cool and, and felt natural. And I think when you have deep history, like um, the more that authors can do that kind of thing that doesn't give you all the information, it just gives you a taste and you, you like it, um, works really well. Anybody else? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> pass. <laughs> it's got to get the, um, the feeling that there's a lot of history behind the world. It didn't just exist, start existing two pages before. Um, if you're the type of writer that likes writing an encyclopedia before you start writing the actual book, then great. Otherwise, you just need to sprinkle stuff. You know, and, and so... That, that there's the element, the taste of history, rather than this overwhelming um, thing following you around. You know, I, yeah, I, I think maybe if you had it as like bonus material or things like that, then that yeah. might be good for people that are really into that and want to get like do a deep dive into the world's history. But I think for me personally, it's it's better sprinkled in where it's relevant. Yeah, I think there's a pretty small. I mean, I'm going to say this and, and somebody's going to call me out on it, but I think there's a pretty small 
percentage of readers that really want to deep dive into certain series or books themselves. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got fandoms where they're massively involved, you know, say like a song of ice and fire or something like that. They want to know every single piece of information that has to deal with that <laughs> world. And most just are like, this is a really enjoyable novel. I think I'm going to read more about this <laughs> author, um, you know, or they just enjoy living in the world for the, for what, for what it is. And they don't need to know much more. Now, you know, if authors decide to write little prequels or, the, you know, sprinkle in some novellas every now and, and again, then actually explain a few things, you know, they'll probably enjoy that. But yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that there's all these people going, they better write a history of their world or I'm never. Really <laughs> <Not yet. laughs> <Have you ever laughs> this? <laughs> no, I haven't. This is like all the world building stuff from their series. And it's like, it's just, it's just all world building. There's not a story. In it. This is just all the world building. <laughs> For the people that were like, I want more of it. You love Gosh. reading that stuff, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you don't actually read novels. You just read encyclopedias. <laughs> I also read board games instructions for fun. <laughs> oh, uh, gosh. <laughs> but here, here's the caveat, though, because there was a question here, like, what do you feel about the use of appendices or footnotes by Debbie Spence? Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good comment, because I really like that stuff, and I really like, like, the Riven Codex stuff, but... In all honesty, if it doesn't build organically into the world, I lose a lot of interest. So if you're going to give me a map, I want to know who wrote the map, and I want to know what their political uh, orientation was for, for writing it, and who funded it, and how old the map is, and how reliable it is. You're going to give me an appendice or uh, you know uh, whatever it is with all the terms, I need to know how it fits into the world. And if it doesn't, then it's so dry. Uh, you sound like my editor. I know for myself, I, I even when you do think you know things, I think there's a real I like holding it back unless I really need to put it out because you the because I wanna pretty much I a lot of world building happens because I just want to make things worse for my characters in the most interesting way. So and when you can do that the more information you put out there, you, the more you do start making rules and locking yourselves into things. And if you do that arbitrarily early on and then later on, you're like, oh, it would be great if this happened because that would be the worst possible thing to put that character through right now. The less you put out there, the more you've hinted at, the, the kind of more plastic it still is, the more the way the creation could keep continuing. So that's why even, yeah, sometimes it's, I've had things where it's like, I could explain this, but maybe I'm going to throw that out and make it something else later on. So yeah, even though it's that balance, even for myself, we're going how much to give away to soon. I love that. It's like, yeah, if you're ever going to put in like a fact, like, is this going to prevent me from tormenting someone down the road in a yeah. way that I don't want to do? Yeah. I, I do think at least having a deep history of your world in your head is very helpful because just like with characters where their past affects their actions and what they do in the future, I think having a deep history to your world affects your world building and what is happening politically and economically in your world at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's and, then, and then they just break all those rules. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Um, so, <laughs> This one's going to be a fun one, and you guys may get stuff to listen to. Uh, how does world building improve a story? Shouldn't characters be enough? <laughs> so, yeah, it's okay. you, guys, you guys get the hard questions. I have easy questions for every other panel. <laughs> I, I know my answers. They're just not always popular when I talk about them, so I'm like, oh. Wait until somebody else says something. <laughs> Come on, Justin. You can't say that and then not. Yeah, yeah. So, no, no, no. I know. You're holding something back. It's all I, just, I, I like world building so much, and everybody already kind of knows it. I spent 15 years on my book series before I was confident enough to like write the freaking thing. And, and that's not a good way to do that. I wouldn't tell anybody to do that. I would tell them they're a moron if they did that. But that's what I did because that's what I like, and that's what I was comfortable doing. And it worked, and and it's still working for me. And but again, I agree with what everybody else is saying, but it doesn't work for me personally. Like I, I love all those little granular details, and I like finding ways of sticking them into my book. But I'm also like, oh, my editor's probably going to tell me to par that out. So maybe <laughs> I should just not write it. But maybe I can find a way to fit it. No, 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 no. I shouldn't shoehorn it. I should like let it be organic. But I've got so much to pull from because I've done all the research ahead of time. When I actually get down to writing, I don't have to 
think too hard about how to make the world interesting. I've got too much stuff already, so I'm trying to figure out how not to include all the stuff I've I've outlined and just use the the most interesting things. And that gives me a lot of freedom sometimes for like, you know what, this thing I was going to do, I'll skip it because I've got a better thing that I was going to do like 20 chapters from now. I'm just going to do that instead. And and I have that freedom because of all the world building stuff. But for other people, if that doesn't work for them, that, that would be a terrible idea. That would, yeah. that would ruin their whole series. So I can't give that advice to everybody else. Works for me though. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's interesting you say that because yeah, I have I my approach is different. I just did every like I sort of did the I, I do like characters and dialogue and scenes like that a lot more than I like world building, or at least as a starting place. So, you know, I start with just characters in a place doing a thing and then let the I do the world building backwards, I guess. And it seems like you kind of come up with the world first and then you can inject characters very easily into it. And I sort of come up with the cool characters and then I I, I don't think you can have this is probably, you can never make rules like this and then there's always an exception, but I think it's difficult to have really good characters that exist in a world that's unclear to the reader. And whether they know all the details of like how this dynasty went back nine years or nine nine generations rather, or they just have like a really good sense of the world without ever being told like, you know, this big timeline. Both of those things can work, but you do need to have a good sense of place for your characters to be to be like real and compelling inside of. So I think you, you kind of need both, but you can be thin on one and heavy on the other. It's just like you have to do one of them really well, maybe. Um, and if you do both really well, you you, I don't know, struck that, struck the, the idea, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You do it all really well, and then you don't have problems. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you want. I think, I, think, I, think, I think characters, everything, right? You can have two people in an empty room having the most amazing conversation, interaction, tension between them, and you can have the most amazing world that's as boring as anything if the the characters aren't doing anything but you, you, you've got to everything adds to everything else it's about putting the right stage around your characters to walk out on that's going to add to the tension and add to the pressure all the time and to make it all worse for them you know I, 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 it all works hand in hand but one can't overpower the other you need the magic and the intelligence to to come together to create the substance but that's I, yeah I do I do think because the beauty of especially if, yeah in fantasy and sci-fi is you can make that room the best room for those two people like you create it all get and, and for what they're doing it, it's all it's all done in tandem so I think ideally when you build a world you know it works best I think when you go oh this world wouldn't be as interesting if it was any other person in it because you can go everything that's happening around just gives sheds more light on them and it's yeah it's because you get to like if you want to choose like you, if you know in real world you have to go everywhere you choose has a certain amount of kind of either connotations or imagery in these things and that reflects differently off you know different people where when you can do it all together and find that moment where you can go like oh we could we could follow this other character here or could see what's happening there but yeah Ideally, it's all one thing, and if you pulled one, you know, pull the character out, the world wouldn't be as interesting, and vice versa. I think, with um, especially with fantasy, one of the wonderful things about world building is that you can bring that sense of wonder to your story that you might not necessarily get with, um, say, like historical fiction or something, because you can make something up. And you can show your readers this this amazing thing and make it real to them. And I think that that is, to me, uh, an important part of fantasy because, I mean, yes, I read for the story. I read for the characters. Those are very important. But um, I also yeah. like to read for that escapism and also to see this world that this person has built and to feel like I'm there. Um, I also think that world building is can be very, very important to plot. Um, so I think that, yes, you know, maybe characters, yes, characters are very, very important, but I think that world building still has an important place in fantasy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the great things about Brian's book was, uh, you know, he's got these amazing dragons flying overhead and doing terrible things, but his characters <laughs> are big enough to overshadow the dragons. You know, cause it, and, and you do need those powerful personalities to to overcome the wonder of the world in a sense, because you don't want them talking about something over here and everyone else is 
looking around them sort of thing. Um, so I thought Brian did that brilliantly in uh, his book. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, but no, it takes a bow. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll Venmo you right after this. Don't worry. Uh, for, for our agreement. <laughs> um, but no, it's a couple back, of dollars. <laughs> but you know, that one thing Mike said that was interesting, the idea that like two characters talking in an empty room can be compelling. And I think that that's really true. It made me think of, um, I feel like Raymond Carver was famous for saying this about his own work. Mine are just stories about people. Like, I don't describe the room they're in because I don't care what room they're in. And it works for him because he was, you know, telling the stories about like marriages that are crumbling and these like very kind of human emotions, interactions. But I think the cool thing about fantasy and world building is that you can have people having that same emotional, like, I don't know, like tornado in a blank room in a Raven Carver story. But in fantasy, it can be like after they've been kidnapped by some like goblin caravan. So you can have that same like really human moment just in a backdrop that's completely of your own choosing and really colorful. And it's it, that, that, I mean, that's probably why I wrote a fantasy book instead of like a Raven Carver type, you know, more modern thing. Like I, I wanted to do it with dragons. That's the only <laughs> reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that and I'm not Why, why did you writer. write your book? Well, <laughs> to, to do dragons. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> No, he said, why, why did you write your books? Like, because I wanted dragons. That's, that's yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good reason. I started writing a Raven yeah. Carver, and then I just had to put a dragon in. And uh, yeah. now I'm a fantasy author, and I don't yeah. know what to do about it. And I think I did when I got out of college, I was writing like, hey, yeah, kind of like Raymond Carver knockoff stories. And I wrote one where a guy was just like, he just drove home from work and in his head, his marriage was not going well and he didn't like his job. And then the climax is he pulls into his garage and closes the door. So I couldn't pull off his stuff. But if you, you know, if you throw fantastic creatures and swords in there, you know, it comes off a lot more interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I, a lot of mine came from the fact that going off a similar thing like that feeling a bit of that feeling like that the world seems so magical when we're kids and then we kind of make these decisions through life to kind of and generally often to be seen like to be an adult or you know to be seen a certain way and then you turn around one day and life isn't so magical anymore but you kind of have a feeling it's your fault and <laughs> a bit of that feeling like yeah. that those choices you make destroys a bit of that connection to the wonder that you saw the world as when you were young and yeah, that could absolutely be a story about a guy in an apartment, <laughs> you know, like looking at the job he's taking and that. But instead, yeah, you go like, oh no, let's actually take a world where there was magic when this guy was young. And then yeah. he did make some choices that that now means it's a world without magic. And yeah, let's like, it's I, I love stories where it actually is the minutiae of that moment and the reality of actually going to someone's psyche but someone else, but I'm not as interested in writing that as taking that idea and making it fantastical and huge. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so one of my co-reviewers, Medjay, uh, sent in a question. Uh, how do you tackle the immense research that's required for world building and how do you not get lost in your own world building? Justin. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel called out by that one. How do you not, how do you not get caught up in your 15 years of research? <laughs> Um, so personally, um, cause I, I use, I like finding new tools for things and I, so I'll, I'll utilize like everything I can. So I'll, you know, I've got books on it. I'll read a ton of books. I'll listen to a bunch of podcasts. I'll, I'll see what everybody says. I'll collect as much information as I can. And then of course there's like all the stuff I want to do to put in my books. So I've got all those notes. I've got like so much stuff that I want to put together and initially it was very haphazard where I was just like well here's a notebook that my wife gave me I'm going to add stuff to it no and here's a yellow uh, journal pad whatever yellow pad uh, I'm going to just fill this up and I did oh and, and now I've got my uh, I've got one of these journals here where I can pull out all the notes and I can add new stuff when one of the section gets filled up and I use that but it's terrible for organizing stuff so <laughs> at some point when I was writing my first book I started using Scrivener and if, for those that are familiar with Scrivener, so I use that now. Yeah, um, yeah. And every time I write, if I've got stuff where I've been jotting stuff down, I'll take a picture of something and stick it as a file in my Scrivener docs. And I've got my research section and I keep my old versions of books, like for book one, Master of Sorrows. I've got all the research that I did for Master of Sorrows in that document still sitting there. And I don't transfer all of that research over to book two because it's in book one and I don't need it, but I'll take some of the things that I think I know I'm going to be accessing a lot and I'll transfer those over. So it's kind of like a living document and I've got all of my Scrivener files that give me all those things. They're all in the cloud. 
Um, I have my own way of accessing the files and sort of coding things to tell me where things are. Um, but there are different like stages where like at one point I was like, I don't know what my world looks like. I need to spend like three months doing a map. And I did. And then uh, I was like, oh, and now I need to name the cities and uh, the the businesses and the trade that is between the cities and like, uh, and, and, I start, and I started jotting things down. Oh, and the monsters, I need a section. Of the and I just kind of started populating things. And for a while it was kind of like, you know, the people that do like Dungeons and Dragons campaigns, they'll spend like 30 hours mapping out something and then they only spend like two hours, three hours playing a game and they only do like 5% of the stuff that they planned to do. They're world builders. Uh, and I did you know, play a lot of RPG stuff when I was younger. And so that's just natural for me. And it's okay if we don't squeeze everything in, You, but you know it's all there. And that's kind of a comfort. And you've got a way to access it and everybody doesn't have to see it. But if they do, they'll be happy or they'll not like it, but that's fine. Um, you find a way to put it in organically if you have a good way to organize it. That's how I use I use Scrivener primarily for organizing my stuff, but I don't know what other people do. Yeah, I use like a mixture. I, I do I do write my stuff in Scrivener now. I wrote I wrote Blood of an Exile in a Word document like a crazy person. And then someone told me about Scrivener like way, way afterwards. Like so being able to like just drag and drop chapters was incredibly helpful. But yeah, I do a mixture of like I, I'll take notes in Scrivener. I'll also take notes just when I'm walking around and stuff like that in, in Evernote. Well, I actually have like five different ways that I take notes, but um, I should have one, but they're, they're sort of everywhere. And then, yeah, you sort of have these folders that I'll organize, you know, once or twice a week into like what kind of idea it was, whether it was um, a part of the world I'm working in now or something completely irrelevant for like a down the road time that one day I'll hit where I'm not working on this, this trilogy, I guess, specifically. Um, so yeah, I have like a like a running list of a lot of different things, and I, I think for an author, it's good to get lost in your world building. It's just that you know, kind of like um, like we've been saying, that just doesn't always make it onto the page. And when it does, it's sort of like you did like a month long like deep dive into how a piece of your world works, and all that amounts to is one very specific detail in one scene that you can actually explain for like four or five hours why that thing happened that way and what it all means. It's just that the reader doesn't really need to know that. But I do think. It That's a really good explanation. Work. That's a fantastic <laughs> explanation. Yeah, it's like it's to have you do a lot of work for one really cool sentence, and even if the reader doesn't like know all the implications of that sentence, they feel that this is like a well thought out world with a lot of stuff going on underneath, underneath the surface. Yeah. So fancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, personally, do you think do you ever feel like people are cheating when uh, somebody has a really good sentence and they're like, "I don't know what that means. I I didn't do the world building for that. I just." Don't. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, oh, oh. I feel really called out now, Justin. <laughs> I, 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 I was on a, a panel with Joe Abercrombie and Garth Nix once, and a similar question came up. And one of them said, well, you know, if you, they were talking about throwing, if you're going to throw someone out of a window, you need to know if, that, that if there's glass and how's the glass put in the, the frame and held there and all this sort of stuff. And I just sat there thinking, oh, my God, I just threw a character out a window. <laughs> I didn't go, I just knew there was glass and he went out and it hurt, you know. Um, I didn't do any of that stuff. I mean, I, 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 don't yeah, know. I make a lot of this stuff up as I go along. I mean, I, I read a lot of books about France during World War II and the occupation because that was the main inspiration. And I watched a lot of movies, you know, and the details you get in movies is enough to kind of still the story along. Um, but yeah, I'm not the, that encyclopedia guy and I'm not writing loads of notes down. Um, I'm just in the story rattling along, wait to see what happened. I, I take a similar approach to Mike where my role building is very haphazard. Um, I mean, I do start out with, you know, going to the library and checking out a bunch of books and reading through those and kind of just trying to absorb some of the feel and what I want to be going on in my world. Um, Although I do find with haphazard world building, you do have to go back later and then try to organize it. Um, I have used Scrivener. Scrivener is very helpful for that. Um, I also just started using uh, SlimWiki. So that one's really helpful because I can go in there and then connect the different world building aspects that I've put together. Like, oh, like this is about the different islands. And then I can click on the individual islands and come up with the information for those. Um, so I found that actually helpful um, just because it's it gets very hard to keep track of all the things that you put together. Yeah. 
I, yeah, I, I feel like I'm going to come across as such a noob with all this, but yeah, but like I use like one node is just what I ended up using with the same thing, having all the folders in there for each creature and character. But I'm, I think I've got some apps I need to download to <laughs> at least do this in a cooler way by the sound of it. But yeah, and that's often, and it's kind of nice. I, I guess I, I, I did a bunch at the beginning, but then more it's like as it goes on, it's nice knowing like if I'm going to suddenly encounter someone, it's, it's that great reminder of going back and looking at like, okay, what, what races have I got here? What have I set up and established so far? What did I have in that chapter that I pulled out, but now I can bring all that stuff back in. And it's great having that stuff. It is nice. I feel like that's how I kind of use it is it's great having it there so that I can, that it doesn't get in, too much of the way of the flow. Like, so I yeah, have all that stuff there. So when I am in that writing mode and just want to kind of keep bouncing on following the plot and character stuff of it, I can grab those pieces. And sometimes it will be like, I will just throw something in there for now. Then that bit happens in the folder. I'm like, okay, I've got to sit down tomorrow and I'm going to, now I'm going to do the actual kind of historical stuff and, and do a lot of that after now I've actually done the scene. I go, what I want to happen here what I want this character to bring into the story. Now I can go do the world building that best serves, makes them both fit into that better. So hmm. yeah, it's once again, kind of bouncing back and forth between them a lot, but I definitely, and I, but I mean, I feel like I've got, I've actually got like the creation myth of my world that no one will ever know and how it kind of goes from the beginning. And that kind of gives me something in my own head to at least ground how the magic and everything else comes together. You'll have to send but me your I, notes, Luke. I'll read it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very intimidating. I'm sure, yeah, I go, that does not make, that wouldn't have happened if, when, if that came in at this point, you'd be in this age by now and they'd all be, yeah, in flying cars. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so that I have the bits and pieces there and it's especially helpful like as going between books when you suddenly, I don't know, take that little break and have to go back into the world again. It's amazing the stuff you can come up with and write down and then completely falls out of your head. I don't know, for me, it's... It, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like I have that mixture of like, yeah, I have like a cool idea while I'm in the shower exercising or whatever. I'm like, oh, I'll never forget that. That's so brilliant that it'll be stuck with me forever. And then I'm like, by the time I'm back at anything to write down, it's completely gone. Or I'll wake up in the middle of the night and write down an idea that I think is amazing in like the haze of sleep and I read it the next morning. And it's like, it doesn't even make it sense. Never it's completely is. insane. Yeah. You have that as well. If you got that folder with all the chapters and the segments you got rid of, but you're like, oh, but I'm going to put that back in later. And then when you get to it, I go, I'll just go through and have a look. Like, oh, these are terrible. These are terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think I I've ever added back in the stuff I cut out. No. Yeah, I have, I have a folder in Scrivener called the Scrap Pile. And for, so, I, and this, I'm actually curious how much rewriting you guys are willing to do. I feel like that depends on whether you're willing to shoot from the hip with, with world building. I'm perfectly happy to rewrite my book over again. But I have... Yeah, the folder is called the scrap pile and I keep it where it's not in like the word count, but I moved it over the other day and I had, I had 180,000 words of just cut scenes for book three. And um, like, that's more than the book itself now. Right. I'm, not, I'm not even close <laughs> to being done like editing and writing it. So I don't even want to know what it's going to come out to. I, but yeah, I, I'm curious. I never count. You're insane. <laughs> all, all the cut chapters. No. I can I just depress yourself. I, I can cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Man. Yeah, I oh, I don't cut out as much as as you do. I think, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's because of the world building stuff. I've, I've already written a lot out that I know I'm not going to include. So the mm -hmm. stuff I do choose to include, I feel really attached to it because I'm like, well, I put that in instead of the other nine things, so it should get to stay, right? And then my editor tells me, no, it doesn't get to stay. So to <laughs> go. Yeah, I've had I've had a joke from that from book one that I wanted to get in and I cut it out of book one and put it into book two. I was like, yeah, I finally got it. Like, this is the perfect spot for it. And I cut it out of book two and moved it to book three. I was like, no, this is definitely it. We're getting this joke in. And then yesterday I cut it out. I was like, no, it's never going to work. Just put in the acknowledgements at the back. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> Here's a great joke. You yeah. guys will love it. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be the title of book four. <laughs> I, I yeah, have, we, we got it. Yeah. I, I have a song that I wrote that was uh, supposed to be in the like first prologue of book one, and it didn't make it into book one. It got cut. And the same thing with book two. I was like, well, it exists in this world. I just don't 
I don't know when anyone's going to be singing it. So it's the Codex version is who we put together <laughs> yeah. after we're done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh! And I'm yeah. interested with you guys then. How much? Just when we're talking about like editors and beta readers, do you, with a lot of that world building stuff, do you rely on people when they're like, "Oh, I'd love a bit more here," or yeah? Because I've I just found for me, I actually hadn't read a lot of fantasy at the beginning. Like like I I this is a, I've written a fantasy book, but I wasn't a big fantasy reader before, and I almost feel like even by putting Orbit as a stamp on my book. It's almost like that people have certain expectations and there was a bit of a gauge with me at the beginning in talking with the editor and going to real fantasy readers and going, oh, I need to, you, you need to do, if you're going to give your book to a fantasy reader, sometimes they are expecting more world building than someone who kind of reads broadly and picks up stuff from here and there. Like they really go, oh, I, I, you said this, I want to know what you're talking about. And I was like, oh, I thought I could just, you know, that's just the name of this place and that happened. And they're like, well, you know, but do you want to get you don't here? really care about that, do you? Yeah. <laughs> really? I think a lot of fantasy readers are really like, no, no, no. If you said, a, I, I need to know, like, what year did that happen in this? It's like, oh, okay, I've got the nose. So um, I still rely a little bit on, it's, well, actually, I, I think actually, funnily enough, I think I hit the groove with the second one. But the first, with, with the first book, I really relied on, kind of going to fantasy readers and going is is have you felt shortchanged at any point or have i then overcorrected so yeah no i, I think it's funny and i i did my um my agent uh one of her first pieces of feedback was to go and i do have an appendix it's, it's more like a it's a description of all the different dragons in the book and she had told me one of the first things to, was to go back and then write an appendix of all the different different dragons. And then I think she meant for me to take like a couple of days on it and then come back with like a little physical description. And I spent like three months on it. Um, <laughs> and, and part of it was that she told me like, I'm gonna give you feedback, but like, it's gonna take me a while. So while you're waiting on me, just make this appendix. So I had like time on my hands, but yeah, then I came back with this like massive primer. And she's like, okay, that's cool. But again, cut out like 90% of that, that's yeah. way too much. Um, but it was fun. I did use it like kind of we, like we've been talking about. Like I did go back and inject a lot of details from that big thing into the story sort of throughout. So yeah, I, I was told to put in more world building. And then it's funny because I did a different kind of appendix for the second one on my own volition. And she was like, no, that's cut that out. That's, <laughs> that's <fine." laughs> You just make it too much work for yourself. You adjust and just need to have a podcast, Jen. <laughs> yeah, I... I really think a lot of hours of, of what appears to be wasted effort in retrospect in my writing process. I'm not very efficient. You're just going to have a 200,000, you know, like blooper reel book based on all the things that you just haven't put in your novels. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the only people that read my book before it gets published, I, obviously my agent, my editor, but I, I always send it to my father and he's not a fancy fan at all. And um, I sent him We Are the Dead and he got to about five chapters in. And he rang me up and he went, are you okay? <laughs> he said, this is, you know, do you need to talk about anything? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, no, no, it's all just made up. He goes, no, no, it's really disturbing. <laughs> but, you know, this, it's not normal to think like this. <laughs> you get some really deep-seated things that you're trying to get out. <laughs> I definitely use beta readers personally. Just um, I, I tend to underwrite the setting and the first draft. And it's, you know, like we've all said, it's, it's in your head or you've written it down somewhere, but it doesn't always make it onto the page. And then I realize later that somebody's like, hey, what about this thing over here? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, good. I'm not alone then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you ever were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's tricky too. And like, yeah, like a reader will be like, well, what about this? And it's like, well, you have the answer for it. So you don't feel like the detail needs to be in there because like the things connect in your head. So yeah, having, you know, readers can can catch that stuff way easier than you ever can. Um, so the pieces that are missing. What What's hard for me is when I write something like that and I do include the detail. And then later on, my editor's like, uh, and they kind of polish that part out. And I'm like, oh, but now they don't know how that works. But I guess it's not important, so that's fine. We'll just move <laughs> on, take a deep breath, and I do. But then later on, like in book two, I'm like, wait, does anybody know how this works? I can't remember if this was cut or not. And then I'm like having this crisis where I'm like, I don't know whether this needs to be explained. I don't remember. And I I know I wrote it, but I don't remember if I, it was kept. So mm -hmm. little things like that can be difficult. Yeah, definitely. 
Yeah, and then you know you have readers that read a novel and find something and reach out to the author and ask them why they did such a thing. Brian, I'm looking at you, and uh, <laughs> and they can never explain why they did it, and you just have all these heartbroken readers that you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I we won't, we won't I, go into detail. <laughs> yeah, well, there is yeah because I do get I do get about an email a week about people who are unhappy with the decision that I made, but I also get it's funny. Um, Emails pretty consistently. I have a donkey vomit in the scene in my book, and donkeys can't can't vomit, which I just didn't didn't know. And it was funny because I was research. like, no, it was, okay. <laughs> I, will, I tried to make him vomit, and he wouldn't. Right. So that was like, <laughs> it was like one of the last scenes that I wrote. Like it was in first pass, even I think that I did it and I added it in there. And what I was doing before, I would do like a Google check of everything that happened. It's like can x happen to y and i'm like i missed some i'm sure but i i forgive myself because that one was done so late in the process that i didn't do the ken donkeys vomit google search but um <laughs> but at yeah, the end of the day it's a fantasy novel so i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not yeah, the like, same donkey yeah, the, i mean if you yeah, go donkeys, donkeys, yeah, donkeys yeah, the donkeys in yeah. terror are different and they they learn how to like it. genetic <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you're going to have dragons, might as well stretch the truth just a little bit. Yeah, um, all right, last question. Uh, are there any, uh, I guess, books you read growing up or movies you watched or TV shows you watched that maybe somewhat influenced the world building that you use in your books today? I mean, I, 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 would, I would say yes, but like what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, James Clavell's Shogun. Um, I saw the Richard Chamberlain mini series when that came out when i was a kid and that blew my mind and got me hooked on japanese culture and probably one of the reasons why i went to live out in asia for 20 years and things like that um and yeah i've ripped off everything in my book from that i mean influence influence, <laughs> influence right. anybody else i'll jump in uh so i, I mentioned um David Eddings earlier with the Riven Codex. So the first fantasy novel I ever read was um, that like, one, the Encyclopedia. No, I feel, I feel like it's, I'm feeling like he's getting paid for plugging this book. I mean, <laughs> he's dead. He doesn't care. I'm sure. Um, but well, I'll say this. So David Eddings, um, very influential, very well known in the 80s, 90s. Uh, influential to me as as a reader. Um, and his world building is really great. Although it's also super two dimensional, especially looking back. Um, and he he kind of has kind of a cardboard cutout paste for like uh, whole societies that are very kind of racist. Um, so people that are more woke, they'll read David Eddings and be like, oh, this is not great fantasy. It's not very nuanced. And I'm aware of those things, but he does other things that are really good. And one of the things that I really love is his mythologies. And he has gods that are talking with people and the characters that he creates for those gods. I always loved so much. And I always wanted something more like that. And you just don't see a lot of that. You did, you know, in certain series, you'll see that. But I always love that sort of thing. And so I wanted to incorporate that into my own books. And I think a lot of it got carried over into my books um, with mythology specifically. Uh, but I try to learn from his mistakes too, because uh, I'm aware of those things. But he was the first fantasy author I ever read. So. Trying to think, I feel. Well, I feel like because my one answer is like just all the normal people who influence everyone. Um, but I think the the one that comes to mind though, especially because I read it when I was a lot younger, is Bernard Cornwell, who's not even really writing fantasy, but it did influence me because I read his um, his Arthur series when I was a, a pretty little kid, and it was the first time that because um, I've been super into just the Arthurian legends in general, which kind of have more of like a fantasy magic slant and all that. So. I thought it was really cool to see him put it into like a realistic like world and context and um, you know try to take a thing that's very mythical and fantastical and, and give it sort of a grounded a grounded retelling so um, I, I like it, it's funny, I was like I don't know 12 or 13 when I when I read those and I just didn't know you could do that you know it seemed like you can either do one or the other um, and so that that probably influenced me later on when I started actually writing myself. So for me, I'm going it, to, it's not fantasy, but when I was a kid, I read um, Dune and that had a big effect on me just because I think all of the politics and the um, 
the different factions with their different goals, kind of jostling with one another. And then, you know, a big thing for me was um, the planet Doom and the giant sandworms, because that was just an incredible image. And I just, yeah, I think that carried over. I lost you again. And there we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> just, just, just for a second, though. We heard about that. <laughs> that carried over uh, for me in the sense that I wanted to write stuff that had that kind of big sense of wonder to it. Uh, and I guess, yeah, doing something that's not fantasy, but um, but well, it is kind of a fantasy world, which I think is America as as it was depicted in like film noir, but a lot of those films of the time. Like, you know, I've been to LA now and it's, you know, and I think even at the time that's not how people, you know, quite acted and what it was like, but there was a particular, there is a, it happens to every, you know, we fictionalize all the real places when we put them up. So yeah, for, for my books, I very much took, tried to remember and absorb what my impressions were like of that place and those people when they were played by Sydney Green Street and Peter Laurie and all those kind of, you know, quite brilliant heightened actors of the time and kind of, yeah, drew a lot of them into my world. I gotcha. Um, well, it's a little early, but uh, I thought we we could go ahead and maybe do some uh, some book pimping if that's <laughs> if you want to do that. <laughs> so uh, so we'll start with Brian again since we're we're going. Top to the oh, oh no, I have, right. pimp, I have to pimp first. Crap, <laughs> uh, you, gotta, you gotta put on the spot. <laughs> all right, so let's see here. Yes, yeah, so my debut again was Blood of an Exile. Hold on, hold on. So here's the UK and US cover, U US, UK. Um, so yeah, I feel like I've talked about a decent amount, but my elevator pitch is that if you like dragons and if you like Wolverine from the comic books, you'll, you'll dig my story. It's you know, an answer to a few fill the fantasy world with dragons and then dump the grumpiest version of Wolverine into the middle of it. That's, that's pretty much what we got going on there. I love that. Um, yeah. That's so let's pitch. see. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a uh, best books of the year by Amazon and Kirkus for 2019. And I think it is on sale right now for the ebook versions at least. So, you know, get you some if you, um, if you're interested and then yeah, the sequel is Sorcery of a Queen, and that is coming out August 4th in the U.S. and August 6th in the U.K. I think that I have those dates right. Those, those sound right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm really disappointed because you you showed me, what was it, a, a blanket that was made for you that has oh, your yeah. book on it? <laughs> it seemed crass to bring it out. <laughs> it out. Before you, you got, I show it off. Off. So I have to give context, though. My sister-in-law made this for me. I did not do this myself. So he totally right. did. <laughs> I didn't. I can like have her Wait, test to it. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Wait, Wait, Drink he yourself. He brought this out during yeah. our uh, during can our session. Yeah. Oh, like a full thing. That's super. Cool. <laughs> wow. That's ridiculous. It's actually like a really comfortable blanket. So I, uh, <laughs> and he uses it every day. <laughs> I kind of want a blanket now. Where did she get that done? Like just asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, I, I will, I'll, I'll circulate. I'll, I'll DM you guys. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, I was gonna wear like a cape, but that seemed a little bit crass. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Meg. Sorry. That's all right. Um, mine is "We Are the Dead." Um, it's a heartwarming tale about what happens when the bad guys win, kill everyone, and, and take over your country. Um, and it's a, a story about a coward, um, a crippled soldier, and a teenage terrorist, uh, and a single mother just trying to survive and do the right thing in horrible circumstances. Awesome. It's been described as Quentin Tarantino meets um, David Gemmell, so I was quite happy with that one. <laughs> Those are some good ones. Those are some good ones. Yeah. It's awesome. I'm almost finished with it, and it's it's incredible. I love it. Um, <laughs> I feel like tonight I can finish it probably. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Twenty bucks is yours now. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that was going to come back. Yeah. Yeah. One, yeah. One, one, one Venmo transaction, you know, one scratch at the other. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, Justin. All right, so my book that came out either this spring or last year is Master of Sorrows. This is the U.S. edition, which looks almost exactly like the U.K. version because it's got a cool cover. <laughs> um, uh, and let's see. I probably shouldn't plug the other ones because they're not coming out for either a year or like six months or something. Um, but the 
the series is the whole concept of what if the hero were actually like the Dark Lord, and seeing that evolution of the hero um, as a reincarnation of that character uh, throughout the series. Um, but that's the, that's the pitch for the series. Like the main thing for the book is a uh, it's like a lot of traditional fantasy tropes. I take them and then I kind of turn them on their head. So it's a boy who's raised by a wise old man. He goes to a magic school, all that fun stuff. And then I try to twist everything just a little bit. So it's not, it feels like something you've read before, but it's completely different. It's got a lot of, um, people have made a lot of comparisons to like, uh, cause it's got a little bit of a slow burn sort of like name of the wind with Patrick Rothfuss. Um, but then there's a lot of um, like the magic system world building stuff feels a little bit like Brandon Sanderson. Um, and then David Eddings, of course, with the mythology. So there's some comparisons there. There you go. Luke. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sorry. My, I'm using some of my books to hold up my <laughs> laptop right now. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Last Smile in Sunder City. Uh, so, yeah, that was my debut novel. Uh, came out early this year. It's a hard-boiled detective story set in a fantasy world where the magic has died. Uh, so in this, his first case, he's tracking down a missing vampire professor uh, as we get to know the city and uh, get some, you know, a bit of a history as to how uh, Fetch Phillips is his name, how he ended up in the city and um, what's been going on with him. And then the sequel, Dead Man Ditch, comes out in a few months. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> that cover is awesome, by the way. I love that cover. Isn't it great? No, thank you. Yeah, they did an amazing job. Yeah. All of the covers. So far, I love all. Yeah. Of Some, there, there aren't any stinkers so far. <laughs> <laughs> so since mine isn't coming out in September, um, I don't have the US ARC, but I have the UK one, which has a different cover, um, but it's nice yeah. and shiny. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's Bone Shard Daughter, and it's coming out in September. It's the first in a trilogy. It's called the Drowning Empire Trilogy. Uh, it's set on an archipelago of many islands where each citizen has to donate a shard of their skull to the empire. And then the emperor uses those to power these monstrous constructs that enforce law and order. But his rule is failing. So it's an Asian inspired setting where people are basically just trying their very best in a broken world. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that one. I, uh, ever since the cover reveal, I'm like, all right, oh. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The the cover, the final cover and the first chapter up on io9, if anybody wants to read it. Fantastic. And Andrew, if there, if we have like a little bit of time, I don't know, uh, you mentioned that your magic system <laughs> is like based in like programming and coding. That's, that's really cool. I'd never heard of anything like that before. I was well, just, it's, I mean, it was like inspired by that. <laughs> okay. So, gotcha. Yeah. I mean, it's like these, each of these, Cards can be used to inscribe a command, and then those commands are put into the constructs, and they can um, basically work with each other to produce like more complex um, I love that. actions and things like that. And then somebody can basically, you know, try to uh, modify it, but they can break it in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also like the less complicated ones. You can kind of fool them by like lying to them or telling them a story that makes it kind of like contradicts their uh, programming. So <laughs> kind of gotcha. like short circuit them, yeah. That's really cool, I love that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Gosh, now I wanna read it even more. <laughs> <laughs> dude, dude, like. <laughs> right? <now>. <laughs> um, anybody else have any, any last comments you wanna to, want to say? Any other world building, you know, little quick topics or anything <laughs> you wanna chat about? Or does everybody feel like they their brain is pretty much emptied? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, well, guys, uh, I appreciate all of y'all coming on today and and agreeing to be you know part of this panel. I know it's been only about a month process to get everything together, but uh, I've really enjoyed uh, listening to all of y'all talk. I know I've I've spoken to a few of you guys before, uh, and Andrea, it's 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 wonderful to have you on as well. We're definitely looking forward to your debut. Um, but just, you know, thank y'all. Thank everybody that's tuned in so far. Uh, again, this will be hopefully loaded at the end of the day. I just, there's no time to get these loaded up. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, just, uh, we, I mean, depending on how this goes, you know, by the end of it, I mean, it's, it's gone really well so far, you know, with this may be something that happens again. 
but you know, we'll see how fatherhood, how much of a toll that takes starting in June. <laughs> right. So, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to be doing anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I won't even be on social media. So. <laughs> but, uh, but just thanks again. And uh, everybody, definitely check out all of these authors' books uh, and be looking forward to uh, Jonathan Jans coming up here in about 15 minutes. And then we've got another panel starting at 3 uh, with some big names talking about uh, the writing process. So hope you all tune in and uh, everybody else. Thank you again. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you, David. Good, good to meet you, everyone. Good to meet you, everyone.